The original Xbox was a once in a lifetime console packing ludicrous amounts of power into a small box, boasting more power than any console ever had before it. But today in 2017, I got one for free. The original Xbox I have here is one that I got from a friend who just happened to pick up from a shop they passed by in town. Unfortunately it is broken and refuses to even start, so we're going to see what we can do about that. Specifications wise though, the original Xbox is a powerhouse with a 733MHz Coppermine Pentium 3, 64MB of DDR SD RAM which offers more bandwidth by running in dual channel, the graphics chip is an NV2A which has power somewhere between a GeForce 3 and a GeForce 4 chip, the chip itself is capable of outputting a blisteringly high resolution of up to 1080i, an amazing feat for a console this old. Finally, it has an NVIDIA Soundstorm audio chip offering you impressive 5.1 stereo surround sound. However, we can go more in depth on those specs in another video. We started by placing the Xbox upside down so we could get the screws out and pull it apart. Next of all came removing the hard drive and disk drive which connected with an IDE cable as well as a 4 pin Molex connector and a proprietary connection on the CD drive. There are a few screws that keep them in place, but by this point I'm pretty sure you can tell the Xbox is very similar to a PC internally. Now we needed to identify what model of Xbox this was to make sure it's safe to remove the clock capacitor which goes bad after all the years the Xbox has been in use. And as you can see by the Connexent video transcoder, it means it's safe to remove the capacitor. As the box wouldn't even power on, I wanted to get the motherboard out of the case and cleaned up to make sure that wasn't the problem. It has some more screws to keep it in place and it's very similar to the layout of a PC, so it doesn't take too long to actually get the motherboard out. The capacitor itself was really quite simple, it was just a matter of pulling it off some pliers and the leakage didn't seem too bad on this model. After this was removed we wanted to get the heat sinks for the GPU off as this seemed to lack any form of real cooling at this point, due to the hard rubber that the thermal paste had become. It was weird and not even quite sure why that had happened, it had become really just hard baked by it. Of course, this was probably going to be our main issue as we found out later on. After this, of course, though, it made sense to take a look at the CPU as well. So we took the heatsink off that and it didn't look too bad, but the thermal compound had seemed to have just disappeared. So we tried to get the majority of what was left off the CPU before applying a fresh layer and reattaching the heatsink. Also, to make sure the board was completely clear, we sprayed it down with some light solvent spray and gave it a comprehensive brush down with a small brush and then a wipe over with a cloth to make sure that none of the dust or rust was causing any issues with the board or the traces on it. After this, we placed it on the roof to dry out. As for the case, a lot of what looks like dust is actually rust beginning to spread across the bottom. The fan was clogged full of dust, but the power supply did look fine. However, with the state of the fan, it's safe to say that a lot of the heat would have been trapped inside the console, so some components may have been damaged. But we got the majority of it cleaned out, and then it was just a matter of putting it all back together and getting it all set up to be tested. So now with that all plugged in, let's see if it'll actually work. We've got it all connected with standard composite cables and at the start things did look hopeful, but the Xbox returns with three restarts, then a flashing red and green light and some weird noises. But with some cleaning and help from the original Xbox subreddit, I managed to get it to boot games but only with sound. It seems that the video chip on the Xbox is completely dead, but parts wise everything else seems fine so I'll definitely be keeping this unit for spares and repairs. But I didn't want to finish this impromptu video there, I was really rooting on the console actually working. So I pulled out my original Xbox and it does work so we're going to show you what you guys could have seen. <laughs> The 
original Xbox was and still is one of the easiest consoles to mod, so you'll have to forgive my lack of a stock dashboard. However, with that all set up, let's get on with some benchmarks. Up first, who could forget Halo 2 with its gorgeous graphics and stable frame rate all in the 480p resolution. It supports 16x9 widescreen as well as online multiplayer which is still usable via the Xlink Kai program. The game can be picked up for around 50p or 75 cents depending on where you live and is one of the cheapest ways to experience the game. Another testament to the Xbox's graphical prowess was Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, which is running with a locked and stable 30fps in the 480p resolution. Sure, the settings are a little low compared to the PC and the game can drop a few frames here or there, but the controls for the Xbox are so well mapped compared to the original PC release that I'd be willing to let this slide. That's not saying the PC version is bad, and due to the Xbox having a high purchase price and the updates to the PC being a lot more stable, I'd have to recommend opting for the PC version here. However, the Xbox version will only set you back £10 or $12. A game next that is only really playable on the original Xbox console. We have Forza, which I'm guess is running in the high settings as it does look amazing on the console and has no PC port to compare to. The 480p resolution holds up okay today and the frame rate, although not blisteringly high, remains a locked and stable 30fps. It's cheap too, with it costing £1 or about the same as that in dollars to buy. Fable The Lost Chapters was quite the feat for the original Xbox console, with it maintaining a steady 30fps lock throughout the majority of gameplay, as well as running with a mixture of low and medium settings and looking pretty good with those. The game has some expansive environments as well as gorgeous model design. It's also very cheap to pick up today with it costing £3 in the UK or £4 in the US respectively. But earlier on, didn't I mention HD gameplay and high frame rates? Well here we have Soul Calibur 2 which is a testament to both of these things. Running with a native 720p and a locked 60fps, the game never drops any frames and looks great with smooth animations to match. Personally, I think it could rival the visuals of an early Xbox 360 game or a PS3 game. The game is from an enjoyable arcade style which might be a bit limited for some people but I found it enjoyable and is relatively cheap to buy today for 55p or 75 cents. But then again, the Xbox was so powerful that it can even emulate the consoles previous to it. Super Mario 64 running with the Ultra HLE emulator turns us with a great looking game with sharpened visuals and an enhanced 720p resolution. The game maintained its locked 60fps and never dropped below this, so I wasn't able to fix the Xbox. But these parts will come in handy if I ever come across another console in need of repair. Thank you very much for watching this impromptu video. Good night! Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, or dislike if you didn't. We have a large video on its way which I'm certain you guys will enjoy.